Imagine standing before a grand, intricately locked door. Behind it lies a mystery, a concept that has been misunderstood, misinterpreted, and yet, holds profound spiritual significance. Today, we're unlocking that door to explore the world of indulgences in the Catholic Church. Indulgences. The term may evoke a range of emotions or thoughts. You might have heard of them, maybe in passing or perhaps in a deep theological conversation. They've been the center of controversy, the cause of historical schisms, and yet, they remain an integral part of Catholic theology. But what are indulgences? In essence, they are a way to reduce the amount of punishment one has to undergo for sins. It's important to note however that indulgences do not forgive the sins themselves. They remove the temporal punishment that a sin incurs, even after the guilt of sin has been forgiven in confession. Perhaps you're wondering, why the need for indulgence if confession forgives sins? Let's use an analogy. If a child breaks a window while playing they might apologize which is like confession, and be forgiven by their parent, akin to absolution. But they still might have to do extra chores, representing temporal punishment, to make up for the cost of the broken window. In this scenario an indulgence would be like someone else offering to help with or take on some of those extra chores. Throughout this video, we'll delve deeper into the nature of indulgences, their types, partial and plenary, and the conditions required to gain them. We'll also provide practical examples of actions that can lead to indulgences, and discuss who they can be obtained for. Furthermore, we'll tackle common misconceptions and historical abuses of indulgences, and strive to clarify their true purpose and significance. So, are you ready to step through the door and journey into the heart of this spiritual mystery? Let's begin. In the realm of Catholic theology, indulgences hold a unique place, but what exactly are they? Indulgences as per the teachings of the Catholic Church serve as a method to reduce the temporal punishment for sins. Now, it's crucial to understand that indulgences do not absolve the sins themselves. Instead they work on the aftermath, the temporal punishment a sin incurs, even after the guilt of sin has been confessed and forgiven. You might wonder, if confession forgives sins why do we need indulgences? Think of it this way. If a child breaks a window while playing, they might apologize and be forgiven by their parent. That's akin to confession and absolution, but they might still have to do extra chores to compensate for the cost of the broken window. That's the temporal punishment. An indulgence in this scenario, would be like a generous neighbor stepping in to help with or take on some of those extra chores. In other words, while confession brings forgiveness, indulgences address the cleanup process, the reparation that follows. They help in restoring the spiritual balance disturbed by our sins. But not all indulgences are created equal. There are two types, partial and plenary. A partial indulgence, as the name suggests, removes part of the temporal punishment. A plenary indulgence, on the other hand, wipes the slate clean, removing all of it. Achieving a plenary indulgence, however, is a bit more challenging due to the conditions required. But more on that later. In essence, indulgences are not shortcuts or easy passes. They are spiritual aids, tools that help us grow in faith and repair the damage caused by our sins. They remind us that while God's forgiveness is infinite, our actions have consequences that we need to address. So, indulgences tackle the after-effects of sin, even after the sin itself has been forgiven. But there's more to this story. Like the varying shades of color in a painting, indulgences too have their variations. Enter the world of partial and plenary indulgences. In the realm of Catholicism indulgences are a fascinating concept, as they offer a way to reduce the temporal punishment due to sin. But did you know that not all indulgences are created equal? They come in two varieties, partial and plenary. Let's start with partial indulgences. As the name suggests these reduce only a part of the temporal punishment due to sin. They're like a friend offering to share the load when you're carrying a heavy burden. They're not going to take it all but they'll certainly make it lighter. To gain a partial indulgence you need to be in a state of grace by the completion of the act to which the indulgence is attached. Now let's shift our focus to plenary indulgences. These are the all-stars of the indulgence world. A plenary indulgence removes all the temporal punishment due to sin, yes you heard that right, all of it. But as you might guess, these are a bit more challenging to achieve. To gain a plenary indulgence you need to meet several conditions. First, you must be in a state of grace at the time of the indulgence act. That means you've confessed your sins and are free from mortal sin. Second, you must have complete detachment from sin, not just mortal, but even venial sin. This isn't about just going through the motions but about a profound transformation of the heart. 
Further you should receive the sacrament of the Eucharist, preferably on the same day. Remember the Eucharist nourishes our soul and strengthens our bond with Christ. Additionally you should pray for the intentions of the Pope. This could be an Our Father and Hail Mary but feel free to use any other prayers if you are so inclined. And lastly, you must perform the act to which the indulgence is attached. This could be a range of activities from reading the sacred scriptures to performing works of mercy. As we delve deeper into the topic of indulgences we see that they're not just about reducing punishment, they're about turning our hearts towards God, about committing ourselves to a life of virtue and grace. Whether partial or plenary, indulgences are a gift from the church, drawing us closer to God and helping us grow in holiness. They're not a shortcut or an easy way out, but a call to deeper conversion, a call to turn away from sin and embrace the life of grace. While partial indulgences remove a part of the punishment, plenary indulgences, though harder to achieve, remove all of it. So let's strive for plenary indulgences, but remember, even a partial indulgence is a step in the right direction, a step towards God. Let's take that step today. Gaining indulgences is not as simple as flipping a switch. It requires certain conditions to be met. Indulgences, whether partial or plenary, are not rewards that come without effort. They are in fact, spiritual benefits that require a certain degree of commitment and discipline. Let's delve into the conditions that one must meet to gain these indulgences. Let's start with partial indulgences. The church teaches that to gain a partial indulgence, you must be in a state of grace at least by the completion of the prescribed work. This means that you must be free from mortal sin. Additionally, you must have the general intention to gain the indulgence and carry out the act to which the indulgence is attached. This act could be anything from reading the Bible devoutly to reciting certain prayers. Now, moving on to plenary indulgences the conditions become more stringent. Firstly you must be in a state of grace not just at the end but at the beginning of the prescribed work. This means that you should have confessed your sins with a firm resolve not to sin again. Secondly, you must have complete detachment from sin, even venial sin. This is perhaps the most challenging condition. It implies a state of the soul where the desire for sin has been completely eradicated. Thirdly, you must receive communion, preferably on the same day you perform the prescribed act. If this isn't possible, church teaching allows for communion to be received within a few days. The fourth condition is prayer for the intentions of the Pope. This is an act of unity with the church, acknowledging the Pope as the Vicar of Christ on earth. Finally, you must perform the specific act to which the plenary indulgence is attached. These acts are prescribed by the church and can range from reading the scriptures for half an hour, to visiting a cemetery and praying for the dead during the first eight days of November. Now you might wonder, why are these conditions necessary? Why is the church asking for so much? The answer is simple. The process of gaining indulgences is not just about reducing temporal punishment, it is about fostering spiritual growth and discipline. By fulfilling these conditions, you are not only working towards an indulgence, but also engaging in acts that deepen your faith and draw you closer to God. It's about cultivating a spirit of penance, a love for the Eucharist, a devotion to scripture, a respect for the church's authority, and an unwavering commitment to living a life free from sin. Meeting these conditions not only helps gain the indulgence, but also fosters a deeper spiritual growth and discipline. Now that we know what indulgences are and how they work, Let's talk about some practical examples. Indulgences are not abstract concepts but tangible actions we can incorporate into our daily lives. Let's explore some of these actions that could lead to partial or plenary indulgences. Firstly, consider the act of reading the Bible. When done devoutly, this can grant a partial indulgence. Picture yourself perhaps early in the morning or late at night, settling into a quiet space with your Bible. As you read you're not simply flipping through pages, you're contemplating, meditating and absorbing the Word of God. This is a form of prayer, a conversation with God. And in the Catholic Church, this devout reading of the Bible can lead to the reduction of temporal punishment for your sins. But what about plenary indulgences? These require more effort, but they also offer the complete removal of temporal punishment. One way to gain a plenary indulgence is by spending half an hour in Eucharistic adoration. Imagine yourself in a serene chapel before the Blessed Sacrament in a state of humble adoration. During this time, you're not asking for anything, you're simply being present, acknowledging the Divine Presence in the Eucharist. This act of pure adoration, when combined with the other conditions for a plenary indulgence, can lead to a full remittance of temporal punishment. Another way to gain a plenary indulgence is through reading scripture for half an hour. 
This is similar to the earlier example of reading the Bible but it requires a longer more focused period of engagement. It's not about rushing through chapters but about truly immersing yourself in the sacred text, contemplating its messages, and applying them to your life. Lastly, performing the Stations of the Cross in church can also lead to a plenary indulgence. Picture yourself journeying through the 14 stations, each representing an event from Jesus' passion and death. As you move from station to station, you're not just recounting a story, you're walking with Jesus, sharing in his suffering, and reflecting on his immense love for humanity. This act of devotion, when done in a church and accompanied by the necessary conditions, can lead to a plenary indulgence. Remember, indulgences are not a shortcut to heaven, but a way for us to grow spiritually and deepen our relationship with God. They are a reflection of God's mercy, allowing us to lessen the temporal punishment due to our sins. But they're not just about us. Indulgences can also be offered for the souls of the deceased, aiding them in their journey towards heavenly bliss. These actions, when done devoutly and meeting the set conditions, can lead to the gaining of indulgences. Whether partial or plenary, these indulgences serve as a reminder of God's infinite mercy and the power of prayerful actions in our journey of faith. Indulgences once gained can be applied, but to whom? Let's delve into this thought-provoking question. According to Catholic teaching indulgences both partial and plenary can indeed be applied, but the options are not infinite. The Church teaches that indulgences can be applied to oneself or to the souls of the deceased. That's right, you can earn an indulgence for yourself or for a loved one who has passed away. You might be thinking, why can't I earn an indulgence for someone else who is still alive? Well the reason lies in the nature of indulgences themselves. Remember, an indulgence is a remission of the temporal punishment due to sin, the guilt of which has been forgiven. When we talk about indulgences we're talking about personal spiritual growth and individual reconciliation with God. This personal aspect means that while you can certainly pray for others and perform acts of charity on their behalf, the gaining of indulgences is a deeply personal journey, it is something that each person must undertake for themselves. Now let's consider the application of indulgences for the deceased. This is a practice deeply rooted in the church's belief in purgatory, a state of purification for souls who have died in God's friendship, but still need purification to enter the perfection of heaven. When you gain an indulgence for a deceased loved one, the church teaches that you are interceding for that soul, asking God to apply the merits of Christ, the Blessed Virgin Mary, and all the saints to reduce that soul's time in purgatory. It's a beautiful act of love, a spiritual work of mercy that you can perform for your loved ones who have gone before you. So, while you can't earn an indulgence for another living person, you can certainly do so for a deceased loved one. It's an opportunity for you to express your love in a profound spiritual way, reaching beyond the barriers of life and death. Like many spiritual concepts, indulgences have been misunderstood and even misused. In our journey through the Catholic teaching on indulgences, it's crucial that we address these misconceptions and historical abuses to shed light on their true purpose and role in Catholic spirituality. Indulgences, in their essence, are not a quick fix or a get-out-of-hell-free card. They are not a way to simply erase our wrongdoings without any personal growth or remorse. They are instead a profound manifestation of God's mercy, a divine assistance to help us face and rectify the temporal effects of our sins. One of the most common misconceptions is the idea that indulgences can be bought or sold. This misunderstanding stems from a dark chapter in church history, when certain unscrupulous individuals did sell indulgences, leading to widespread corruption. This was one of the factors that sparked the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century. However, the church condemned this practice in the strongest terms, and it has been strictly forbidden for centuries. In fact, the Council of Trent, held in the mid-16th century, issued a clear and unequivocal decree stating that the selling of indulgences was a grave error and that anyone involved in such activities would be excommunicated. The Church has always taught that indulgences are a gift of grace, freely given by God, and cannot be bought or sold. Another common misunderstanding is the belief that indulgences can be used to bypass the process of confession and repentance. This couldn't be further from the truth. Indulgences are not a substitute for confession but rather, they complement it. Remember, an indulgence does not forgive the sin itself, it helps to alleviate the temporal punishment due to sin. Confession and repentance are still absolutely necessary for the forgiveness of sins. Finally, 
The misuse of indulgences can lead to a mentality of spiritual accounting, where one might attempt to earn indulgences in a mechanical or calculated way, without genuine love or contrition. This misses the whole point of indulgences, which should be seen as opportunities for deepening our relationship with God and growing in holiness. They are not about ticking boxes but about engaging in acts of love, devotion and repentance. In conclusion indulgences are not tickets to heaven, but aids to spiritual growth. They help us to face and rectify the temporal effects of our sins. They invite us on a journey of transformation, encouraging us to turn away from sin and towards God's love and mercy. They remind us that while God's forgiveness is always freely given, our sins do have consequences, and it's up to us to make amends. Remember indulgences are not shortcuts to heaven but aids to spiritual growth, helping us to face and rectify the temporal effects of our sins. They're an invitation to deepen our faith, to grow in love and holiness, and to truly live out our calling as children of God. Today, we've journeyed into the heart of a complex theological concept, unraveling the mystery of indulgences. We've learned that indulgences, according to the Catholic Church, are not tickets to forgiveness, but rather, they're ways to reduce the temporal punishment one has to undergo for sins, even after the guilt of sin has been forgiven in confession. Remember our analogy of a child breaking a window? The child may apologize and be forgiven but they still have to make up for the broken window. Indulgences are like someone else stepping in to help with those extra chores. We've delved into the differences between partial and plenary indulgences. A partial indulgence removes part of the punishment, while a plenary indulgence removes all of it. Achieving a plenary indulgence is challenging due to the conditions required such as being in a state of grace, having complete detachment from sin, confessing sins, receiving communion, praying for the Pope's intentions, and doing a specific act attached to the indulgence. We've also explored practical examples of actions that can lead to partial or plenary indulgences, and clarified that indulgences can be applied to oneself or to the souls of the deceased, but not to other living people. Lastly, we addressed common misconceptions and historical abuses of indulgences, such as the selling of indulgences in the past. We learned that indulgences are not get-out-of-hell-free cards or ways to buy one's way into heaven, but are aids to spiritual growth and deepening of faith. This has been a journey into the heart of a complex theological concept, and there's always more to learn. I encourage you to continue exploring this topic and to engage with it thoughtfully and respectfully. If you found this video enlightening, please share, like, and comment. Don't forget to subscribe for more explorations into the world of faith. Check the description box for further reading. Goodbye and God bless.